Hello, everyone. Welcome to Notes to My Legal Self. Uh, this is a show where I interview the in-house legal professionals about their career aspirations, uh, about their personal endeavors, and about their community lives, because we know that in-house legal counsel are human first, and humans care about those things. Um, I personally, in the last couple of years, I have canceled many travels. Um, I love the rest of the world. I was born outside of the United States, had an opportunity to travel. My, my last job, I was traveling 80% of the time. Um, I found myself completely settled in my new office. Welcome to my office. Um, in the last two years and become, have had a much less mobile lifestyle. Uh, but one of the things that comes up is, you know, how do you practice internationally, even in COVID? Um, and how do you give advice and how do you uh, really reach and have a, maybe a culturally different life as in house lawyer? That's a question that comes up quite a lot. And um, uh, during the pandemic, I had an opportunity to meet uh, many in house lawyers who actually have been able to do pivots and, uh, and practice law internationally outside the jurisdictions where they actually are qualified. Um, and today I have a very special guest who will share his insights uh, about the opportunity abroad. Nikhil, welcome to the Notes to My Legal Self. Please introduce yourself. Thanks, Olga. So my name is uh, Nikhil Patel. I'm chief legal officer at a company called Upfield in Amsterdam. I look after Asia, Middle East, and Africa, and I'm also the Global Antitrust Council. Um, as my name suggests, I'm from India, and I'm also barred in India, but I have a master's from the UK as well. So I'm happy to be here, and thank you, Olga, for the invitation. Yeah, well, let's situate you so people can appreciate the depth and breadth of your experiences. Um, you're clearly covering a few geographies today um, and located in the country, not where you barred, or have your master's in the third country. So, uh, But how did you get to where you are today? What, you know, what were the stops along the way? And at what point did you decide to kind of do this kind of international gig? Well, I think those are all good questions, right? So I've always been interested in travel like you. I was born in a particular country and I was given, I was privileged enough to have the opportunity to travel quite a bit from a young age. And I really enjoyed it. So I thought that as I move forward in my career, that's something that I tend to look for. And I've been lucky enough during the course of my career to work across a couple of different continents, Africa, uh, the middle, well, Europe, of course, as well as Asia. And... The way I see it is, is that, you know, if you're looking at this kind of a career, you really need to be someone that enjoys traveling because otherwise it gets really, really difficult to pick up and appreciate the different cultures that you're interacting with. Yeah, that's definitely a learned skill. As somebody who traveled quite a lot from a young age and, and you know, my parents and I have uh, changed locations every two or three years. So I've been always that, that new kid in class. Um, I'm really um, good at it. My husband, on the other hand, have, has never loved the United States until he basically married me. So uh, we <laughs> approach, uh, so the irony of it all. Um, so, you know, if we approach travel very differently, it was a kind of uh, different degree of fear and curiosity. And uh, But those skills are learned. So I've seen him transform and myself transform over time. Um, I guess, just logically speaking, you know, Africa and Europe and Middle East are very different places, just like culturally, but also legally speaking. Um, how does one become, you know, the jack of all trades? Being a general counsel typically means being a generalist, right? You, you dabble in all of the different areas of law. You rely typically on external counsels or specific hires for specific expertise. And what I found is, is that the, the, the thing that makes it easiest for you to kind of relocate your skill set is to also become a deep industry expert. So in terms of my background, my, the majority of the companies that I've had the privilege of working for were pharmaceutical companies. And as a result of which, I have found that it's easier to get positions abroad within the pharmaceutical industry, despite the fact that I may not be locally qualified simply because the depth of knowledge of the industry as a whole, considering that it's relatively niche and kind of specialized, overcomes that uh, hurdle of not being technically qualified within that country. And it also helps to have an industry that's international, like pharmaceuticals again. Yeah. 
I like the conversations about industry because I think lawyers underappreciate the importance of industry just generally. I think one of the questions that often comes up is sort of how do I get more on a business side? How do I join corporate boards? And I actually think focusing on industry is the answer because that's how you transcend the legal practice or geography in your case to, to do other things. Um, and actually, I want to follow up, you know, on, you know, tell me actually more about what do you mean by sort of industry right now? Like, like how do you, what is, how do you approach it intentionally? What does it mean to be an industry insider? No, that's a fantastic question, right? And the, I'll answer that a little bit differently to the way the question is asked and not so much from the legal perspective. Let's say that you were looking at a sales role. You would hire someone that has experience selling products that are the same or similar to yours. And that's what I mean from the legal perspective as well, where if you have an in-depth understanding of how the products or the services or you know how your industry kind of functions, it makes it significantly easier to overcome the traditional question of, oh, but you're not a qualified lawyer in you know, the Netherlands, for example. How will you add value to my business? Yeah, yeah, no, that, and, and that's exactly the question you answer as an executive or a board member. So let's you know, break down. When you sort of, you know, you've been in pharmaceuticals for a while, you know, I, you know, I guess maybe I'll, I'll start with how I do it. I, I tend to sort of, there's a body of, of, of law that you need to know, yes. There's, you know, a body of practices, business practices you need to know. Um, and then there is sort of people. <laughs> and that I tend to break down into your sort of your co-workers, your colleagues, both internally, externally, your regulators, um, your suppliers, your stakeholders. So I tend to kind of think of it as, bodies of knowledge and and human relationships um, how do you think you know and and that's kind of how when i approach like this is an industry because I, I i have some deep expertise in some industries and i've also immersed myself in this so i have a kind of a, a theory how i become an insider uh gorilla style tell me how you approach you know, this intentional insider knowledge development. Sure. And that's actually something that I find quite funny because law school doesn't teach you how to truly be an in-house counsel. I think law school prepares you arguably relatively well to join the law firm culture, but very little emphasis is placed on in-house work. So, I mean, and that's, that's primarily why questions like these tend to come up, right? Which is that, look, okay, I understand the law, at least theoretically, I understand people because I tend to be a people person, but how do I truly understand the company that I work with? What I found works best for me, at least, is to actually spend a significant amount of time with the sales and business teams who are actually responsible for either delivering the services or selling the products. In my case, it's typically the in and out licensing team that at least historically I've worked with the most in the pharmaceutical companies that I've been with. And what happens there is, is that these people pick the most passionate people because that always helps. And these people tend to be so passionate about that product that they will talk to you and explain things to you. And, you know, there are no really silly questions because they're just so glad to be able to have someone that they're talking to, especially since that you can take that information and really add value in the kind of contracts, the negotiations that you do. I mean, I, I think understanding what it is that you're selling for an in-house counsel, at least, is a no-brainer. And the, there's no such thing as too much detail in that situation. I agree with that. Follow the revenue. I mean, in the end, if you follow the revenue, you get to the heart of the business. That, that, that's kind of the natural. But I love the advice of find a passionate seller, right, uh, who, um, who loves to teach, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and become partners in crime. I think that's an excellent advice. I think one of the other things that works for me actually has also been um, following customer success people, they usually tend to really like to teach. That's kind of what they do. Um, and then listening on the on phone calls, I find you really get, you know, you really get to know your customers when you hear their pain. There's something about the pain that really hits home about kind of what you're doing right and what you can do better and how you positioned in the market. Let's talk about sort of the difference between the in-house lawyer who is jurisdictionally qualified and the one who is um, maybe not, but brings other things to the table like expertise in the industry and 
um, and a, a company and, and, and the, uh, kind of knowing people and culture of, of, of everything that goes around and maybe regulators. Um, what, you know, what is the big difference in the way you kind of approach and, 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 and how do you kind of build your practice? No, fair. And to be to be totally frank, I don't think that they're, they're mutually exclusive, right? You could obviously be jurisdictionally qualified and also have deep expertise in the industry that you work in. I don't mean to suggest that you necessarily can't. What I'm trying to say is, is more that particularly in the era of globalization, where you have more and more companies looking to do business across multiple countries, it's virtually impossible to have a general counsel who's qualified in every country you do business in. For example, I was fortunate enough to move uh, into an FMCG company about three years ago, and we operate in 65 countries. So no single lawyer is going to be qualified across all of those. In, and now removing jurisdictional qualification from the question, since nobody's qualified in all 65 countries, what are the remaining differentiating factors that you can put in place to ensure that you would be the best person for that role, irrespective of where you happen to be located or qualified? And that's where I think expertise plays a difference. So does the appreciation for different cultures. A large degree of empathy typically helps as well, particularly when you're looking at higher leadership level roles and you're looking for management expertise across a multiplicity of cultures where you, know, you need to kind of be sensitive in how you put things across, but also empathetic that people may not always perceive what you're, or may not always hear what you're saying the way you intended it to be heard. So you started talking about culture. Let's do that. <laughs> you went there. You know, that, that, that's not a small topic. Um, managing people with different, you know, uh, expectations of, you know, about things like interruptions, eye contact, um, availability, um, different social dynamics is hard. I mean, it's hard to manage people in your own jurisdiction where you're fluent. I mean, people are hard. Just generally, even if you love them, they're hard. So, um, and they, they're very important. Um, so, and you mentioned, you know, uh, this cultural aspect and, 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 and that aspect has kind of a few things, the management, the leadership, the empathy. Um, and that, speaking of things that law school doesn't teach you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you develop that? <laughs> Well, honestly, I think having good managers is key and looking to senior leadership in existing companies that you're a part of already always helps. But again, I come back to the original point, which is travel. I mean, travel teaches you so much about different cultures. And I don't just mean, you, you know, you sort of go to Paris, you take a picture of the Eiffel Tower and you come back, right? But truly immersive travel where you, uh, you know, experience local food, interact with local people and yeah, provided you enjoy it, you know, you'd start to pick up a little bit about who they are and how they come from. And, you know, then things that you may otherwise have taken offense to or would otherwise have said that they could potentially take offense to, you kind of stop doing. So I really believe giving yourself the benefit of that exposure really helps with cultural awareness and how to deal with different cultures. And of course, a large amount of it comes from trial and error, right? I mean, as a manager, everybody makes mistakes particularly when you're just starting out. And I think, you know, most people are quite understanding about that. Um, however, as long as you have the will to improve and as your team continues to grow and you have people from different sort of areas coming in, you, you just pick it up along the way. <laughs> you know, my favorite thing to do is to put myself on a shoe, like literally of the people I'm joining. So I was once invited to um, a function in India, actually, and um, it was a lot of government officials. And I was told that, Olga, you can be Western dress. You don't have to, um, you know, wear a sari. But, you know, just so you know, a lot of people are. So I actually went and, you know, I always had a dream of buying myself the sapphire sari. I don't know why. I just love a, a sapphire color. And uh, India has quite a lot of good color choices. So I had this custom made sari that was supposed to fit me really well. Yeah, and I show up and it, you know, and it didn't quite feel that well. I couldn't figure out why, you know, I was like, everybody tells me it's custom made. It should fit just fine. And then a gentleman approached me from the back and, he, you know, how there's a top and, you know, it, it's supposed to button it from the front, but I thought it, it kind of goes in the back. And I had a hell of a day trying to close it. And he said, 
you do know <laughs> that you're wearing it backwards. <laughs> um, and, you know, but, you know, it's like small examples like that, you know, when you literally put yourself in the shoe of others, um, you understand what it means for them to get ready in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's, this stuff becomes important. And, you, you know, and when you live their lives a little bit more than just kind of from arm lengths, you know, it, it just, it's just different. It, it's just being there and doing what they do and, you know, and, and, and kind of appreciating and kind of because a lot of things are lost in translation. And so my next question to you is um, as a manager, right, who may be also international council, it's not unusual for international council to manage folks in different jurisdictions, Right, you probably do have someone in the Middle East, somebody in Africa, somebody in Europe, because those are usually not the same people. How do you, you know, how do you make sure that they are excited and show up as they are themselves to contribute and feel appreciated, and uh, you know, and appreciated for their differences and what they bring to the table? No, I, I think what you've hit the nose on the head. Right, that's a really powerful example that you just gave about putting yourself in people's shoes. And I think in terms of diversity and inclusion as a whole, right, irrespective of what sort of diversity or inclusion you're talking about, it is really important to make them feel safe. So that means that offhand remarks regarding religions, color, race, sex, etc., even in the guise of jokes, you know, obviously not something that you can do, not just from a legal perspective, but also from a perspective of the fact that you want, as you said, people to come as they are. And what I've found is, is that, at least for me, if you ask, people are usually more than happy to answer, right? So, I mean, the more curious you are about someone's culture or, you know, what they do and how they do it, the more appreciative they are. And if you're willing, like you sort of did with your example from India, to participate, they're thrilled. And that's actually one of the things that, you know, kind of helped me at least uh, move around more comfortably was I was reading this article recently that talked about how when, you are, when you're hesitant to do something or you have a fear of doing it, you should take that hesitancy or fear and convert it into kind of excitement it's, it's instead. And if, if, I was, if you told the, the law school going me, you know, that you're going to move to South Africa or even the Netherlands for that matter, I would have laughed and said, you know what, I have no wish to work in <laughs> either of those countries. But now, I mean, looking back, I don't think I'd trade it for anything. <laughs> well, Netherlands is a very special place. Um, I um, I was just recently um, talking to someone who invited me to speak in Amsterdam, and and they said we hope you can come in, in person. And I said, well, don't take it personal. But the first thing I will do when I get there is eat a lot of waffles. <laughs> <laughs> It's not going to be to see you because I miss that. I miss the experience of going to Amsterdam and and just and and, and do that. It's it's uh, it's so much fun. Um, let's talk about recruiting because you know law, especially in the beginning of your career. But uh, you know, I don't want I don't want to emphasize the beginning because sometimes the middle and the end are also tough for different reasons. Um, and you're searching for different things. So somebody's just going to talk about recruiting generally. You know, finding the job you want, you know, finding a job, is not, a job is not hard. Finding the job you're excited about and love and, and get up in the morning and look forward to contributing and appreciate it for who you are is tough. Um, sometimes for some people, uh, at least once in their life. Um, so let's talk about as an international council, you know, where your search efforts are not even confined to geography because sometimes limitations help. You sort of like search in the universe <laughs> and that's the universe is big. How do you approach recruiting in a way is that, you know, you, in the end, you know, you get a place where you're productive, you know, add value and actually love what you do. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, maybe three or four things to kind of think about, right? The first one that, as you said, sometimes limitations are good. So while your geography may not be limited, or maybe it is depending on, you know, who you are and what you're looking for. I would definitely say narrow your search down to a particular set of roles that you would like to play. Understand and be upfront with yourself about whether you think you'd be at a junior, mid or senior level. And also narrow down the industry that you'd want to be applying to. Obviously, so I mean, once you've done that, that kind of helps at least limit the number of LinkedIn hits that you'll get in an email, right? If nothing else. And once you've done that, 
then what I'd suggest doing is either looking at profiles of people who are already in positions similar to what you'd like to be at. Look at where they went to law school. Look at what they studied. Look at what they used to kind of differentiate them, themselves from the rest, right? Ideally, try and look at other people in your situation, although who have relocated. They don't necessarily need to be from the same country or barred in the same area, but you know, they should technically at least be international counsel. And I think my last one would be be realistic. I mean, if you're looking at something that's typically a closed off area, right? I mean, a good example that comes to mind is working for the government, for example. As a foreign qualified lawyer who isn't a citizen, the chances of getting that role are exceedingly small. Not impossible in some countries, but small in general. So, I mean, while it's important to set the bar high, it's also important to know that there are certain ceilings on what you can achieve, at least initially. Right. So once you kind of understand that and you've got your strategy set on how you're going to look for a particular position and you've understood how people have gotten that position and what they've used or leveraged to get it in the past, I think that's quite a bit of information. Yeah. What you just said is gold. Um, <laughs> I, I like how you, you know, um, said, even though the universe is sort of equal opportunity, you should still focus and, and impose limits. I, I think that's a, that's a really great idea. Sometimes it just really helps to, to go deep and, 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 and really explore all options. I, I am thoroughly with you there. I also very much uh, love the, the second tip of what I tend to call backing into success. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. In the age where all LinkedIn profiles are public, look at a few definitions of success, whatever that means to you. Success is entirely self-defined. That means different things to different people. Not everyone wants to be the general counsel of a global Fortune 500. There are different definitions of success, and it may change as you change and you go through life. Find a few examples, maybe even talk to those people. It's sometimes easier to back into it. You don't even sometimes have to talk. It's kind of obvious what they did. <laughs> they will tell you what they did, what skills they have in their LinkedIn profile. I think that's very, very powerful. Um, and I really, really love the way you, are you articulated. Nikhil, we're kind of coming to the end. I kind of want to talk to you. I actually want to drill down on skills. Uh, you, you mentioned sort of the cultural and the industry knowledge. Uh, as sort of uh, skills, you know, depending who you are, you may classify them as legal business or stuff, but let's just call them skills. Are there any other skills, hard skills, business skills, soft skills, human skills, any skills that as a as someone who wants to kind of be an international lawyer, you should develop? No, thank you. That's actually a great question, right? I mean, let me be upfront. I'm taking for granted that everybody graduating from law school has the legal skills, right? Because obviously, while you're looking for a legal role, legal skills are pretty key to the role. But aside from that and the cultural things like that that you mentioned as well, I think networking is exceedingly important, particularly when you're looking at, you know, getting a position in potentially a country where you, have, where you may know no one else. And that's where what you talked about, you know, picking up on these people who for you at least defines success on LinkedIn is, is a great idea. I mean, just start talking to people, start, you know, reach out to your LinkedIn network. It's amazing how this, this fantastic tool exists, but so few people actually use it to start uh, conversations without an agenda with people that they've never met before, just to try and understand how they got to where they are. And I think that that's actually a really powerful tool. I've had a couple of people do that with me. I've done it myself with a couple of people as well. And, you know, most of the conversations have been positive and really helpful for me. And I hope for the people that I spoke to as well. And, you know, we won't talk about the negative ones because <laughs> there's always going to be a few of those. Yeah, there will be people who, who are not warm. And, and, and that's just life, you know. They, you know, as a lawyer, you should, as a human, you should expect, you should definitely expect that as a lawyer. I, I, and I'm with you there. I think... You know, I, I, I've, I've done, what, you know, I guess, what you sort of essentially referring to informational interviews um, or networking. I, and I've done a, a ton of those. And I, I know a couple of things for sure. Lawyers like to talk. Maybe not publicly, but privately, we are talkers. 
uh, just generally speaking. Yeah. And the subject they know very well is themselves. So like normally they love talking about themselves uh, as most humans do. And then, um, you know, um, I find that we are in the profession that gives advice. So it's only natural that to ask lawyer to talk, to talk about themselves and to give you advice. <laughs> that should be easy because that's who we are. That's what we do. Um, Correct. I think the only thing that you need to be careful about is that you phrase it in a polite manner. You know, don't be too entitled about the messages that you're sending. But try and keep the person, you know, make it a bit personal, talk about specific things relative to them rather than making generics, you know, copy paste sort of messages to everybody. And people will react. I mean, as you mentioned, we're lawyers, we love to talk. I mean, there's no reason we wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, like, you, you, you know, there's ways to prepare and tailor and make it personal and give back, um, you know, so there, absolutely, it's, it should not be a one-way conversation, it should be all, always respectful, but there, you know, if define your success, find it and learn that that, that should be an, uh, a thing that we all are doing with increasing regularity because many of us do not want to have the same job twice. Um, you know, my last question is around sort of you know, balance, you know, what I found myself in pandemic, you know, I, I'm managing global team and global clients, customers. Uh, and I find myself, you know, getting up in the morning in Asia, transitioning into East Coast, then West Coast, then Australia, you know, so, <laughs> and then there's Europe somewhere in the morning or night. Um, you know, that's, you know, I haven't traveled, but sometimes I'm in like five jurisdictions. Sometimes I'm in 10 on one day. Um, that's a lot of jurisdictions to cover. That's a, that is a very long day and it's very hard. And, 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 and I'm not even talking about the intellectual drain of switching gears uh, because, you know, you actually do switch quite a lot of context when you give legal advice in different jurisdictions. So I'm going to ask you a question. Of how do you, I'm not going to ask you, how do you balance? Because I think that's not possible. But how do you take care of yourself and people around you to make sure that this doesn't take a big toll? No, that's a fantastic question. It's actually something that we've been dealing with for the last two years, particularly, you know, as more people are working from home, you tend to have more. There are some people that love it. There are some people that have more challenges with it. But I think fundamentally, just like you said, uh, defining success is different for every individual. I don't think there's a standard work-life balance that works for everybody either, right? I think that's also a very individually sort of crafted balance. So what's a good work-life balance for me may not work for someone else who's in my team. And we need to acknowledge that and say, look, we give you a certain amount of freedom and flexibility to work the way you'd like to work while adhering to a broader set of rules, you know, which is don't miss meetings, make sure that uh, the work gets done on time insofar as it needs to. And I really think what helps me the most is prioritization. I was actually in another training recently that had this matrix on it that said uh, benefit and complexity, right? And anything that was high complexity, low benefit was just marked out as lava saying, do not set your... <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. No, me too. And I found that so incredibly useful because, I mean, you could literally slot most of what we do into one of those kind of corners and then you really know where to focus your efforts. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And I find it, you, I'm with you there. And seeing it on paper, not just in your mind, I, but on paper, it becomes really real when you look at it on paper. Then you like really sort of almost physically trading um and it, it really you under i think to me at least that physicality of writing is very impactful uh Mikhail, i thoroughly enjoyed this conversation i really love your worldview and a very enlightened approach to you know life in general and um being in house lawyer specifically and 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 being an international one so um very helpful and you've shared many insights um would love for you to kind of maybe give one takeaway. You know, if folks get nothing else out of this conversation, what is the one thing do you think that every lawyer, especially every lawyer who is sort of internationally focused, should take away from this conversation? No, so I think my main takeaway is that, look, if you've ever thought about working or practicing in a country that's different 
from where you're currently located or qualified. My, my only takeaway would be to do it, try it once, because as a colleague of mine recently told me, if you don't like it, you can always go back, right? Mm -hmm. And it's much better than having the regret of never having done it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I am with you there. Um, well, Nikhil, thank you so much. Thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and learned so much from you. And thank you. I, I really like the framework to use to approach this, you know, challenging practice, you know, and navigating it. It, it, it is not an easy life and, and you are doing it as a pro. So thank you so much for sharing your tips. I very much appreciate it. No, and thank you so much for inviting me, Olga, and setting this whole thing up. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Um, I'm going to say goodbye to the audience. My favorite takeaway is that of, you know, we can learn from success of others. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think it's, it's, it's a very, very powerful idea. And I find the more you practice, the more clever ways you find uh, to really back into success and not reinventing the wheel. So if you do anything, you know, in the next few weeks and you want to practice something, practice that. Um, I think you'll, you'll find that to be a useful exercise to think through what your definition of success is, who lives us. And, and, and how you can maybe do some of that. And I will see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.